and uh, thank you all of you for your attendance. Uh, I, I will present uh, now the, the present status of the Plato mission. We, we can say Plato or Plato as the British people like to, to do, but we follow the Latin version of Plato. Uh, this mission is devoted to discovering and characterizing terrestrial planets around solar-like stars. And I will try to convince you of what we plan to do in the, in the next years, up to the end of the decade. Why play Plato? Well, basically this is to give credit to the, to the Greek roots of astronomy. Uh, Plato made several references to astronomy in his, in his books, like this one, talking from this world to, to another, or uh, showing in this another quote, uh, how the, the observation of the nature have created number mathematics, has given us a conception of time and the power of inquiring about the, the nature of the universe. It's not only that, uh, but PLATO is the acronym for planetary transits and oscillation of stars. Well, indeed, this acronym was a uh, search uh, to, to be compliant with, with PLATO, with the reference to the philosopher. Uh, what is important on PLATO is that it is not a planet hunter. It is just it's a mission to detect, but especially to characterize exoplanets and their host stars. This is pretty unique. And it will be optimized to reach Earth-like planets in the habitable zone of bright solar-like stars. So what we are looking for with, Pla with Plato are really Earth analogs, twins of the Earth, basically. Uh, Plato is the third medium-class mission, M3, of the, of the ESA's Cosmic Vision Program. This is the, the old Cosmic Vision Program, which is uh, finishing now with, Pla with Plato and a couple of more missions. And the, the first question here is, okay, why do we want to look for Earth analogs? What is the interest in Earth analogs? Why, uh, why not? Uh, we, we know already more than 5,000 planets, but what is the interest in, in Earth analogs? Uh, so the question is maybe a, a bit uh, naive, but the question is that if life emerged in some of these planets, we believe that the, the more similar the environmental conditions were in these planets, then the more similar uh, would have been the, the evolution of life in these planets. And if the evolution of life has been similar to the one here on Earth, we believe that the metabolism would have been similar. And so we would know which specific biomarkers, which, which traces to look for in their atmospheres. Just to put an example, it is very different if life uh, the, the possible evolution of life in a, in a case like the one to the right, uh, very close to, to a star, or in another planet which is more or less in the habitable zone of a solar like stars like, like, like on the Earth. We know pretty well what was the evolution of life on the Earth from the very beginning, from the stable hydrosphere, the prebiotic chemistry, the original uh, RNA world, how the first DNA appeared, and what was the evolution afterwards. And this implies that, uh, for example, now we know how to look in different planetary atmospheres, traces like the CO2, the O3, the uh, water vapor, that could give us indications that there is uh, biological activity in these planets. You can see here the, the comparison between the Earth, Venus, and Mars, and the atmospherical traces are completely different. Uh, for this, it is needed also to know what is the evolutionary state of the of the exoplanetary planetary system. Why? Because, uh, as you can see here in this sketch, the conditions on the planets are completely different from the very beginning to after a few billion years, like on the Earth. You can see here in this plot that at the beginning, life on Earth occurred in an atmosphere without almost any any oxygen. It was only two two billion years ago that different uh, biological uh, mechanisms started to produce atmos uh, oxygen in the, in the atmosphere. And it is only in the last billion year, more or less, or half billion year, that the abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere has been important. So knowing what is the evolutionary state of the exoplanetary systems will allow us uh, to, to understand which biological markers do we have to look for in the different cases. So Plato is one uh, member of the of the ESA's uh, fleet 
to look for, to study exoplanets together with Keops. You, you had a talk by Luca Fossati two, two weeks ago about Keops, also by James Webb. And uh, this will be complemented with Ariel in a few years, who will do the chemical analysis of the atmosphere of many planets. But uh, it is also included in the international roadmap of exoplanetary missions for this next decade and the next decade. You can see here the missions by, by NASA, the space missions by NASA, and as well the, the ground-based observatories, which are developing instruments uh, specialized for the study of exoplanets, including the, the European Extremely Large Telescope in, in Chile. Plato is here, it's a well positioned within the roadmap, and it will be the, the right instrument to look for Earth analogs. What are the specific science objectives of, of PLATO? Well, basically, we, we aim uh, for the determination of the properties of thousands of exoplanets, as I said, including terrestrial planets in the habitable zone of sun-like stars. What do we mean by properties? So we, we plan to, to measure the radius, the mass, and the age of the planets with an accuracy of better than 5% for the radius and 10% for the mass and age. Note that if we have the radius and we have the mass, you are also deriving the, the density of the planet, the mean density of the planet. And this gives a lot of information about the possible structure, the possible composition of the planet, and many more data. Uh, these values these, uh, have been fixed, have been determined for an Earth sized planet orbiting a G0 dwarf star brighter than magnitude 11, more or less. If we are successful in getting this data, we'll be able to, to study the architecture, the formation, and the evolution of planetary systems. And we will also be able to correlate these properties with the host the stellar parameters. So th this will allow us to put our solar system in context with other exoplanetary systems, similar exoplanetary systems. Moreover, we, we are going to, to be able to study how the planet properties evolve with, with age because we are going to, to analyze thousands of exoplanetary systems. And uh, we will be able to, to obtain additional planetary uh, results related to, to exomoons, to planets around evolved stars, and even to do albedo studies of the, of the different planets by the analysis of the secondary transits. One important point is that we will be able to identify for the first time very good targets for the spectroscopic follow-up of, of planet atmospheres. Uh, the, the kind of studies that will be done in the next decade in space and from ground with the, with the extremely large telescopes, and that possibly could give us some hints of the presence of biological processes in, in other planets. And not only this, uh, Plato is uh, many times related uh, or associated to exoplanets, but Plato will provide very interesting science on the internal structure and evolutionary state of thousands of stars, indeed uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of stars. So this will revolutionize completely the, the stellar astrophysics at the end of this decade. Uh, how do we plan to do this? Well, Plato has two segments, one segment in space, one segment on ground. And in space, what we plan to do is high precision photometric uh, measurements. This will allow to, by the transit method, this will allow to identify planets and to measure some of their the properties. And by asteroseismology, we will be able to study the properties of the stars. This will be complemented with the ground-based segment. Uh, we have to do a lot of ground-based observations of radial velocity of the host the star in order to derive, to complement everything. If we, uh, if we complement the transits with the asteroseismology and with the radial velocity results, we will be able to do a complete characterization of the orbital parameters and to derive the radius and mass, therefore the density, and the age and evolutionary states of the different exoplanets. Let me explain you in a few more minutes how this works. This is the transit method, which many of you will probably know. Here uh, below, you, you see the, the transit by, by Mercury. This is a real data taken a few years ago. And this is what we plan to do with thousands of, of stars. This is an example of a transit in exo, three transiting exoplanets 
uh, observed by, by, by Keops. Note that uh, we have to go to the fourth decimal to find uh, the dip produced by the eclipse of the, of the planet. This here is much more recent. This is a result, a very recent result by, by James Webb, in which we not only see the, the transit, but it, this was done in different colors. And we see that the, the properties of the transit depend on the color. This gives information on the presence of an atmosphere and even on the potential presence of CO2 in the specific atmosphere of this planet. So the transit method can provide a lot of information, but Plato will go farther away because we are going to monitor the stars for three years or four years. And this will allow us to, to follow the stars along the whole orbit. And in some cases, we will be able to see the brightening of the planet as it uh, goes to the other part of the orbit and shines towards us. By looking at this data, we will be able to, to measure the albedo of the, of the planet. And we, uh, with this information, we will be able to identify whether there is a rocky surface or a cloudy atmosphere or, or whether it is a nice planet or a planet uh, which is dominated by, by water, by, by oceans. In this uh, diagram to the right, you can even see that when the planet passes behind the star, uh, it should be possible to measure the, what we call the secondary transit, which gives additional information on all these parameters, these, uh, these reflection parameters, parameters of the different planets. This will be done not by for few stars as it has been done up to now, but for thousands of them. The second technique is asteroid so uh, stars oscillate, oscillates due to <clears throat> the way the, the, the stars uh, function in the, in the nucleus. And these oscillations induce tiny photometric variations. And different oscillation modes have different sensitivities to the structure of the star. So if we are able to combine the different, the multiple modes, and we are able to identify the individual frequencies, then we can constrain the star's internal structure and by comparing with models, with theoretical models, we can derive what is the, its evolutionary state and what are the physical properties, even the mass and the radius. So asteroid is a very powerful tool, but it requires extremely accurate photometric observations. This is an example, of, an exaggerated example of how the, the start oscillate because of these internal instabilities. Here you have a real case. This is observations of 16 Cygnus A done by Kepler. This plot is here on the frequency domain and you see the, the different modes of oscillation and the, the harmonics of the different frequencies. And with this information, you can mm, decipher this and derive and constrain the internal properties of the stars with very high accuracy. The last uh, technique, the last tool is uh, from ground-based observations of radial velocity. You probably know already, but the movement of the planets induce also a moving of the central host star around the center of gravity of the system. And this movement implies that if we are looking on the plane, as we do when we have transits, uh, the star in will be receding or approaching us, and this induces Doppler shift of the of the different lines on the star. So but by measuring this, this kind of radial velocity curves like this one, we can derive a lot of properties of the, of the system. This plot here corresponds to the discovery of the first exoplanet, 51 Pegasi by, by Major and Kelos in 1995. This to the right is a much more complex case in which we have many planets. It's a multi-planetary system and uh, deciphering this uh, in radial velocity curve is much more complicated. But on the other hand, it provides much more information, of course. And this one here is an, a recent example with uh, by, Keops, uh, by Kepler, sorry, of a multiple planet system in which we have the transits and the radial velocity curves. When we have all this information, we can characterize the, the planets pretty well. And this is one, this is the main objective of, of Plato. So how? Uh, 
with transit method, uh, we can derive the, the ratio between the planet and the star radii. With asteroseismology, we can define the radius of the star. So inversely, we derive the, the, radio, the radius of the planets. If we have transits, we can constrain the orbital inclination because it has to be very small. So this is one of the ingredients that come here to the right to derive the mass of the planets. But asteroseismology gives us the constraint, the, the mass of the star, which is the second element that comes to the equation to the right. So we have the inclination and the mass of the star, we derive automatically the mass of the planet. And if we combine all these three elements, we derive the complete orbital parameters and the radius, the mass, therefore the density, and the age and evolutionary state of the, of the different exoplanets. So this is how the PLATO program is, is, is compiled. You see that we need very specific observation from space, but we will also need a lot of nights of observation from ground. Uh, what is, uh, you, you could say, well, well why, why the planets that have been discovered up to now are not valid for this exercise? So this is a plot in which we have the number of planets uh, here you, you see in different colors when we know the radius, the radius and mass, the radius and mass for small planets. And, and you see that the, the number of cases for which we have the radius and mass for small planets is really ineligible. It's very small. This is because uh, to use the radial velocity observations technique, uh, the stars have to be brighter than magnitude 11. And most of these planets were detected by, by Kepler but Kepler was aiming to, to stars between magnitude 12 and 16. And for, for, them, for most of them, radial velocity is not applicable. So for, for most of the Kepler candidates, we cannot do this kind of exercise that we are planning to do with, with Plato. You see here that we have now more than 5,000 confirmed exoplanets and around 7,000 candidates coming from Kepler and TESS for for which for many of which uh, no radial velocity will be will be feasible in some cases if there are multiple planets uh, by measuring the transit time variations it is possible also to to define the to derive the mass of the different planets this has been done in i will show an example this has been done in several cases but it is only valid when we have multiple cases with the transits very well defined so the situation now is that we know very few Earth analogs for which we have measured the, its radius and, and mass. And this is where Plato enters. So we are targeting bright stars, much brighter than, than Kepler, magnitude brighter than 11 for the prime sample. And this will allow us to use the radial velocity method for confirmation and for the mass determination. If we have the density, the radius and mass, then we can start to play with different models. You see here three models for an iron-dominated planet, an Earth-like planet, and a an water-dominated planet. And depending on the position of this plot, we can constrain pretty much the properties of the, of the different planets. If we focus on the, the region for, for Earth analogs, here, I, I make it bigger. You see that except this Trappist system, which I will mention in a minute, there are very, very few planets for which we know the radius and mass, and the accuracy is so low that we cannot even constrain their composition. This Trappist system is, is uh, shown here. It's it's beautiful one. Uh, seven planets have been de detected, but they are orbiting a cool M dwarf star, which is a very small one. You can see here in the plot that the whole planetary system fits within the orbit of Mercury. So the conditions, it is a very interesting uh, system, but the conditions are completely different to the ones in the solar system. This is not the kind of planets, the kind of exoplanetary systems that we are looking for with Plato. Uh, here again, I show uh, the the, the planets that have been identified up to now with the radius and mass known and which are relatively small planets. And you see that there are very few and they are concentrated in exoplanetary systems, in very small exoplanetary systems. 
what Plato will do is to cover this whole uh, this whole parameter space, which is up to now almost empty. We don't know almost any Earth analog or Earth uh, similar planet in the habitable zone of, of a third host uh, star. And this is what we plan to, to detect and identify with, with Plato. How do we do it? Well, it's not easy. And it's because of that that Plato is a very complex mission. We need uh, many telescopes. We are planning for 24 telescopes working simultaneously. Why? Because we need bright stars and there are not so many uh, G5 stars in the sky or around G5 stars in the sky. Uh, so this, uh, there are not so many and we need to monitor a large number of them because the only ones which are valid for us are the ones that are completely on the plane so that we can detect the, the transits. And this is are only a small fraction of them. So we need a huge field of view to have enough candidate stars, of, of enough candidate bright stars. And for this, we, we, we need uh, many telescopes because if you have a big telescope, you cannot have a large field of view, but if you have many small telescopes, you can enlarge the field of view significantly. Moreover, an Earth analog generates a dip of around 80 ppm. This is parts per million. Uh, so this means that we need LATCOS with a photometric accuracy better than 50 ppm. This is ex extraordinarily difficult to, to achieve. Uh, and even just if you if you count what would be the photon noise uh, that you need for that, you realize that you need a huge number of counts to, to be below the photon noise. So for this, we have developed very special, special very large CCDs with a full well capacity of around 1 million electrons per pixel. And then, well, if we are looking for Earth analogs, the orbital period will be one year. Ideally, we could need at least two or three transits to, to be sure that we are identifying an Earth analog. So this means we have to keep monitor to, to, to stay monitoring the stars for two, three years at least. And for this, we need uh, a long, ultra stable monitoring of the same field of view without interruptions during more than two years. This is not easy to achieve. So this is what we plan to do, what we are doing now indeed. This is the, the appearance of the, of the Plato spacecraft with its uh, four, uh, 26 uh, telescopes. It's a three-axis stabilized system with a very stable pointing. It's not very large uh, satellite. You see it's a 3.5 meters by 3.1, two and a half tons, not extremely large. We are going to the Lagrange two point. We are not staying in the L2 point, but we are orbiting around the L2 point. You can see that the orbit is, uh, the diameter is, is more than 1 million kilometers. So it's really a huge orbit around the L2 point. This provides a very stable environment that will allow for continuous observations without interruptions during several years. Every th three months, we will have to rotate the spacecraft by 90 degrees to make sure that the solar panels are looking to the sun and we can continue operating. And well, the, the spacecraft is, uh, has been designed with consumables for more than eight years, at least. These are the different elements of the spacecraft. Here to the left, you have a sketch, but to the right, you have real hardware. This is the, the STM, the structural thermal model of the, of the optical bench with the 26 uh, telescopes. And uh, well, here are some details of the individual cameras. We have 24 normal cameras uh, with a cadence of 25 seconds and they're operating white light white light because we need as many photos as possible. And we have also two fast uh, red and blue cameras with a cadence of 2.5 seconds. Uh, these are uh, have been optimized to observe the brightest stars without saturation, to provide color information in some cases, which will improve the science applications. And they will be also used for fine guidance of the, of the observatory, which will improve the, the pointing stability. 
Each camera has four CCDs of 20 million pixels each. They have been specifically developed for a platter. The full well capacity is more than 1 million electrons per pixel. They are indeed the, the largest uh, CCD, CCDs ever flown. Here you have some, some picture of one of these uh, CCDs. And here, well, you, you have to the, to the left, the first full, fully operational camera during integration at CSL in the edge, and to the right, the first uh, flight focal plane with the four large CCDs. Uh, well, we are already testing in the in thermal vacuum conditions and calibrating the face cameras. You see here that the, the optimum focus of the instrument is obtained at minus 77.6 degrees. And uh, the total field of view that we are covering is 2,100 square degrees. This is huge. This is really huge for an optical instrument. Each individual camera has a field of view of 1,000 square degrees, but we have uh, grouped them in six qualine uh, groups of, of cameras. And uh, every group is uh, offset with respect to a central line by nine degrees. You see here the, the diagram to in the bottom part, it, so that the, the central part will be monitored by the 24 telescopes, the external parts only by six, and the intermediate parts by 12 or 18 telescopes. In this way, we are able to, to cover a huge field of view. We are going to have more sensitivity on the center, less sensitivity on the borders, but with this uh, strategy, we can achieve our, our requirements. The telescopes are not very large, only 12 centimeters aperture, and they are working at minus 80 uh, centi uh, grade centigrades, and uh, well, the dynamic range is between 4 and 16 magnitudes. Something very important for PLATO is the data processing system. We have 20 million pixels per CCD. This means 80 million pixels per focal plane. So this means 2 billion pixels for the whole set of, of telescopes. These 2 billion pixels have to be read out, transferred, and processed every 25 seconds automatically on board. And we have to correct and extract around 100,000 individual light groups per camera every 25 seconds. For this, we are developing 12 powerful onboard computers. And well, the one, each computer, each data processing unit can process the data of two telescopes. And there is an instrument control unit that takes care of, of everything. So in total, we plan to produce around uh, more than 400 gigabits per day, which is huge. Is uh, sending this data back to Earth will not be, not be easy. I have to, to say that the PLATO data processing system on board is one of the most complex ever flown in an ESA science mission. Just to show you an, a diagram here how everything works and how here you can see that every DPU takes care of every two telescopes. This is already being built. You have here some of the electronics box which are being tested now and everything seems to be working properly. And well, what is the status of the mission presently? I have been talking mostly about the space segment, but we have also a ground segment with operations, with science operations, with ground station networks, mission operations, and an external team doing the ground-based observations. The spacecraft is in good shape. It has been designed and it has not been modified. Now they are doing the mechanical test of the full spacecraft uh, it will be done in, in May, June. Here to the right, you see the, the testing in thermal vacuum of the optical bench with the 26 telescopes. And well, the, the critical design review will be held this year. You can see here the avionics module during testing. And to the right, you see the, the first elements of the flight units, the first flight elements for the, for the final satellite which are being built now. These are more elements for the flight uh, satellite, which are already available. The payload is also very much advanced. Here you see the testing of the STM, the thermal and structural model of a single camera. And to the right, this is a picture taken a few days ago. 
This is the first flight camera that has already been integrated and is ready to be to be tested. Here you can see the, the integration activities at the CSL in, in the edge. And here you can see that we have already produced many elements for the flight uh, payload and many more have to come. And finally, here you can see some testing of the of the data processing system at the DLR. Well, if if all this hardware uh, works as, as we expect that it will work, uh, this design uh, warranties a uh, photometric accuracy better than 50 ppm in one hour for a G05 star brighter than around 11 magnitude, observed with 24 cameras, which is what we what we aim. But I want to, to stress here that even for the stars that uh, will be monitored in the outskirts of the focal uh, of the field of view with only six cameras, we will obtain photometric accuracy better than 100 ppm that will allow to observe and, and to detect planets also on many more stars. Uh, you, you can see here, for example, that uh, the limits for 50 ppm are for the brightest stars, but for the weakest star, sorry, but for the brightest star, we can reach accuracies for the radius of the planets better even than 3%. So the, the, the system will be extremely accurate. As I said, the, the field of view of Plato is huge. You can see here the two field of views that have been predefined, one on the north and one on the, on the south. And the, well, the observational strategy now has to be decided. For the nominal science mission, we have four years which are already allocated. So the nominal strategy will be two long pointings lasting two years each. But we could also select one long pointing for three years and one year going there and here. The final strategy will be decided two years before launch, depending on what we know about exoplanets at the time. Uh, we expect that the mission will be extended because the spacecraft has been developed for more than eight years. In that case, we plan to do two long pointings of three or four years each, which will be optimal to detect Earth analogs with orbital periods of three years. But we can have also one long pointing for three years and one long pointing for two years, plus one year of step and stair. There are many combinations that will be defined at the, at the very end. But this year in June, we will decide uh, the position and the location of the first long pointing. So that the, if the community wants to start doing some preparatory work on the stars and on these positions, they will be able to, to start that. Uh, we can uh, we are generating two billion pixels per, per 25 seconds so we cannot send this data back to earth so we have to predefine the stars that will be monitored and for this we are compiling the, the plateau input catalog the, the peak which has already been published the, the first version and we have also published already the discussion on uh, how to select the, the optimum plateau plateau fields uh, this here is uh, the first result from the from the peak. The signal to noise expected as a function of the V magnitude. And you can see that we have, uh, this is for one pointing, and we have around 150, more than 150,000 stars, which are compliant with our requirements. Well, I will not go into, into the details, but uh, just to, to show you that at the brighter stars, brighter than magnitude 11, the number of stars is not very large. And here, well, you can see the distribution of the stars that we have pre-identified already. The temperature is peaking around the temperature of the sun, and also the radius is also peaking around the radius of the sun, uh, plus a factor of two, more or less. So we are defining a statistical sample of around 250,000 stars, which is the complete sample for two pointings. And all these are brighter than magnitude 13 or magnitude 16 for some M stars that we are also including. And out of this, there is a prime sample, which is composed by around 15,000 Dwarham subgiant stars, 
uh, which will be the ones that will be observed with the best accuracy. These all are brighter than magnitude 11. And for this, we expect to guarantee 50 ppm in one hour. So with all this, how many planets do we expect to, to find? Not so many indeed. Uh, the, the, the biggest problem is that we don't know what is the, the number of uh, Earth analog or, or planets similar to Earth around the stars similar to the Sun. The, here you can see the different estimates that have been published in the last year. It seems now that the uh, uh, realistic value could be around uh, 0.2 planets per, per star. But this is very uncertain. So we really don't know if uh, the value, the real value at the end is much lower, the number of planets of Earth analog planets that we we'll detect will be very small. Indeed, one of the main results from Plato at the end will be to constrain the real value of this eta Earth parameter. To the right, you can see what are the, the estimates, the original estimates in 2018. Now the, the latest estimates, now that we know better how the instrument will work. And you see that in, in any of the options, we will detect thousands of exoplanets. If we constrain to magnitude uh, brighter than 11, we'll be between 1,000 and 2,000 planets. And we expect to find uh, if the eta Earth is constrained between 0.2 and 1.4. So we expect in any case some tens of Earth analogs to, to be detected by the end of this decade or beginning of the, of the next decade. There will be more with Plato. There will be calls for proposals by ESA for what we call complementary science programs. This includes any kind of additional science that can be achieved by high accuracy long-term monitoring. Well, the, the call will be issued uh, some months before launch, and it will include up to 8% of the science data rate. 8% means thousands of targets. So we encourage you in the future to be prepared to submit proposal for this fraction of the time. So to end, uh, I, I want to stress that uh, the PLATO mission has been developed by ESA and by the PLATO mission consortium, which is up to now formed by more than 800 uh, scientists and engineers all over Europe. This diagram shows the relation between the ESA team, the Plato, Plato Mission Consortium team. It's not easy because we are many people it, and the mission is extremely complicated. And uh, this is being done thanks to the collaboration of many, many institutes all over Europe, uh, most of which are reflected here. So with this and with uh, these acknowledgements, I end. And if you have any questions, please let me know.